All right. Um, how is everybody? We have a lot of people coming from pretty, pretty much everywhere here. Uh, so thank you so much for those who've joined from the US, from Europe. Uh, I'm a bit sorry we are Asian here. So we, we keep you guys waking up late or sleeping late every month for this climate technology presentation. Um, but this is for the code cause. Uh, we've been uh, we've been putting that for a while now, and each month we are gathering a lot of interesting conglomerates, VCs, and CVCs to access to deal flow in climate tech. Uh, this month we have an amazing uh, stack of ten companies that we've been selecting uh, over nearly ninety applications. Uh, so you have the top ten percent of ninety applications we've received. Uh, and uh, and yeah, we have a lot of interesting uh, investors in this call. Uh, we've got um, 50 people registering a ticket. Uh, we have 28 people right now, uh, and I guess a lot of them are in, in um, are in the climate tech space. So feel free to use the chat here uh, to say hello. But also, don't forget to interact with everyone else on the Slack group. I think our team have shared with you the Slack group, and this is really where everything is happening. Uh, the 10 startups pitching today will be sharing their presentation and other details in Slack on the channel fundraising for anyone uh, with interest to get engaged with more details, um, maybe have a potential interaction with them. So yeah, everything is happening on Slack. Uh, our team will share the um, the link to the Slack again for those who are missing, and we're gonna get started in a second. Chopper, we ready to go? Yeah, everything's set. We can start now. All right, cool. Um, so, welcome everybody uh, to Southeast Asia Climate Tech Coalition, and today specifically for our Climate Tech presentation. Uh, the Climate Tech Coalition is a small uh, but a hungry movement of young people like me and, and you uh, committing to influence one billion US dollar in climate tech innovation, investment, market expansion, and commercialization to build the greener future for the Southeast Asia Pacific region. Uh, I'm John Fall, I'm the general partner of Atlas Capital, uh, one of those actors. And with my small fund, Atlas Capital, we've been investing in green tech and climate tech since 2020. You can see some of our portfolio companies here. We have been investing mainly in the US uh, in pre-seed and seed built around the built environment uh, and hardware. Uh, so we have been uh, doing that with a purpose and a very specific mandate, starting from the realization that we are going from four seasons to two and with Atlas Capital, we believe it's too late to try to stop climate change. Uh, this is time for climate adaptation. So climate adaptation is really much what we focus on. Uh, and, and this is really much where the companies we're looking for are uh, in that uh, vertical of built environment and adjacent. With the coalition and with Atlas, uh, we are aiming to connect regional conglomerates with category defining North American and European climate tech companies to help Southeast Asia to adapt and decarbonize. You can see some of our team member here, uh, but really uh, there's a lot more uh, to discover. And I'm gonna share with you this uh, coalition which we talked about. So why Southeast Asia? Southeast Asia um, for a few reasons, but number one, because this is an area that makes up for 20% of the world biodiversity, 10% of the world population. <clears throat> and this area also is of overseeing 1.2% annual rate of deforestation. 85% of the energy supply in Southeast Asia come from non-renewable sources. <clears throat> and there is a 60% projected increase of CO2 emissions in this region towards 2040. So we believe that Southeast Asia have high potential for climate action, but also is poised to see the effect of climate change the most. So we believe that with this uh, Southeast Asia region, there is an opportunity to not only accelerate its decarbonization, but really bring the best companies in the US and Europe to work with local conglomerates, family offices, uh, and industrial partners to expand their innovative technology to this region before it's too late. We call that the adaptation and economy. 
<clears throat> adapting all these infrastructures to the climate change era and turning those cities and mega cities like Singapore, Bangkok, Ho Chi Minh, Jakarta into climate proof cities. And this is very much the mandate where we've been uh, deploying our efforts for the past few years. Every company we support is materializing our vision of turning at net zero and climate proof. Uh, and we use that very small but fun island city as a virtual island to explain what we do. So some of our portfolio companies, for example, uh, have been acting in the building retrofitting using biophilic design. So turning buildings to be uh, better isolated and better energy efficient, for example. Uh, more companies we've been investing in have been using decentralized storage of energy uh, to be able to make those buildings energy resilient in case, of, in case of power outages. Other companies in our portfolio include small nuclear reactor, but also recy circular recycling and also um, uh, net zero uh, agriculture uh, that are in the city themselves. We call that urban agriculture, for example. Anyway, you can see more of these uh, portfolio companies on our website. And you know, I will share a few links in the chat group for you guys to check it out. But you know, I've talked about Atlas. Now we talk about the coalition. So this ecosystem had been funded with a few friends, uh, other venture capitalists in this region, but also in the US and Europe. Um, and we have three things that we give to our members. Number one, we organize a flagship conference in New York City once a year for Climate Tech Week. We just had the last one in September with nearly 200 attendees, 20 speakers, uh, and gathering you know, very, very large uh, family offices. Uh, we had people also representing corporate like BlackRock, Temasek, uh, and a, a very, very, very big group of interesting participants like Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for example. We also run that flagship conference in Singapore once a year, and the upcoming one will be in February 2024. And then we organize also monthly networking dinners in secret location across Singapore, Hong Kong, and Bangkok, which are a great platform for entrepreneurs to connect with them, their friends and their peers, but also for investors uh, to connect with other uh, fellow investors, but also family offices. Uh, so this is something you should really check out. Uh, we had the last one in Hong Kong two weeks ago, and our, our next dinner will be in Singapore next week. Um, by the way, feel free to hit me up if, if you're in Singapore next week. And I think some of the people in the call will be attending the dinner, so I'm, I'm, I'm really thrived to, uh, to, to see you guys um, face to face. And then lastly, we organize those climate tech uh, pitch presentation or competition uh, where we invite uh, proeminent venture capitalists, corporates and conglomerates, uh, VC arms as well, to just check out what kind of deal flow we have. Um, so this is the three activities that the coalition facilitates. And again, this coalition is a platform that we share with other VCs. So it's not just us at last. We have more than 27 uh, other venture capitalists and conglomerate in that coalition that access to this deal flow. You can see we have a pretty packed uh, even schedule for next year. So a lot of uh, opportunities to uh, meet investors and for other investors to share deal flow with, with their peers. So definitely check it out. This is some of the example of the events we had, uh, some of the uh, some of the dinners, some of the conferences we had in New York, um, and yeah, it's 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 a lot of fun, uh, but it's it's really also great to meet with people who are like-minded, who share the same interest to invest in climate technology and really walk the talk to act for the planet. Uh, this is some of our past calls we had. Uh, some of you guys might have been attending already, so you will recognize yourself in the picture. Uh, and this is basically the membership price for uh, the coalition. For 1,000 US dollars a year per organization, uh, we provide startups with a few quite exclusive perks. Uh, number one for startups, uh, they get to be listed into our deal flow which is shared to more than 200 investors who already invested in climate tech and have committed capital as part of this 1 billion US dollar. So these are actually legit investors. They know what they're talking about, uh, being angel investors or being VCs, 
and they are actively looking to deploy their capital. We have uh, also for startups two invitations to present your company uh, during that call, just like the one we're having today over a time of 12 months. And then we also help those startups that are being selected uh, with direct email introductions to investors. Uh, and and uh, and this is you know something we do uh, really on a case by case basis, but that's really game changing. Uh, an example of one company that just had that is a US company called Posh Robotics. We just connected them with a very large conglomerate in Southeast Asia, and they just signed a LOI for $10 million investment. So yeah, this is just one of the examples. And then for investors uh, that are deciding to partner with us and become a member of the coalition, uh, for this same price of $1,000 per year, we gave them invitation uh, to our exclusive investor dinner, uh, but also we help them with a promotion of their fund and, their, and our podcasts, uh, which uh, have a visibility into our newsletter with 12,000 uh, followers worldwide. We invite them as speakers to our flagship conference in New York and Singapore. And uh, we invite them as a judge uh, for these monthly calls, but also we give them bi-monthly opportunities to directly invest in startups that we have been uh, suggesting them in, your, in our deal flow, either directly or either through SPBs. So that's pretty much about the membership. Um, I hope some of you here will be interested to join us. Uh, we really want to help everybody, but um, you know our time is limited. Uh, we have 24 hours uh, a day and probably uh, probably a few hours of sleep. So so we can only help the ones who are the most you know uh, real. And 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 this is the price tag that we have decided to put into that uh, to ensure that we work only with very serious people uh, who are who are who are looking to get our help. Our help. Uh, feel free to ch to scan this link if you want to learn more. Um, and without further ado, um, I'm going to go ahead and talk about today. Are you guys ready? The judges? All right. So today uh, we have a really, really uh, interesting group of judges uh, ranging from very large conglomerates to family offices and to angel investors. So um, I would uh, like to invite uh, Kunata Pong from PTT Group to say hello and introduce yourself. Hello everyone. Good. I get it. Good afternoon. Right. I'm sorry. Yep. I, can, I cannot turn on my camera. I have some technical issue with my computers, and I'm very sorry for that. And first of all, I would like to thank you, at last, to inviting me to be a, a judge of this event. It is very appreciated. Yes. I'm from. PTT Espresso, I'm not sure you guys know about PTT Espresso. It is come from Express Solutions, which is a CVC coverage venture team in PTT Group. PTT is national Thailand national oil and gas company. We are focusing on investment of uh, new energy, new mobility, life science, and also the commercialization. Yes. Nice to meet you, everyone. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and then uh, next we have uh, Amel from uh, Zbox. Can you hear us, Amel? Perfectly. Hi. Wonderful. Nice to meet you all. I'm the head of uh, Zbox APAC. Zbox is the open arm of CMS EGM. Uh, it's a shipped company, top two shipped company in the world and top five uh, freight forwarder in the world. And what we do within Zbox is, is uh, we co-innovate with other leaders in the industry. Uh, we have currently uh, 20 corporate partners all over the world from all over the, the supply chain. And the aim with those corporate partners is to decarbonize and digitalize the industry of the supply chain. And this is the reason why we have among our club a lot of uh, different um, players and stakeholders along the supply chain. Uh, and one of the services that we, we provide to our uh, members are um, the B2B meetings with uh, some startups. And this is the reason why we are here today um, with this great selection. And thank you, uh, Joanne, for that. Um, we will see if any, uh, any startups today will fit uh, one of our corporate partners. Thank well, you, everyone. 
Thank you so much, Amel, uh, to be joining. And then from CMA CGM, we also have Leo. Leo, can you hear us? Do you want to introduce yourself? All right. During uh, the time Leo needs to set himself up, uh, maybe I, we can introduce uh, Frederick. Are you here? You're on mute. Hi, sorry. Yep. Can you can you hear me? All right. Yeah. I think we're gonna go with Frederick first, and then you. Okay. Sure. Hello, everyone. Hello, Leo. <laughs> Hello, Joan. Um, I'm founder of um, Palo IT France and Palo IT Thailand. Um, we're a innovation digital innovation consulting company. We're global offices in uh, in America, in Europe. Uh, in Asia in, uh, and uh, and Australia. Wonderful. Nice to meet you all. Thanks for joining, Fred. Uh, and then um, maybe now, Leo, if you're ready. Yep, perfect. Sorry. Um, so hi, everyone. So I'm Leo, uh, working for CMA CGM uh, in Thailand, uh, in, based in Bangkok. So I'm working as a business development manager alongside with Amel uh, and Dbox. So I'm taking care of the strategic uh, project in Thailand and the uh, investment, uh, working with our uh, Pulse Fund. So it's a fund for uh, the energy transition CMA CGM set up uh, two years ago of 1.5 billion US dollar. So, um, so yeah, that is for me. Yeah, I think after saying 1.5 billion US dollar, you don't have to say no more. <laughs> 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 Thank you for joining. Um, okay. And then Francesco, um, are you here? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. How can I follow that? Um, <laughs> well, I'll try. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Francesco. I'm with the uh, Sustainable Finance Initiative uh, based in Hong Kong. Uh, first off, thanks so much to uh, the Atlas Capital team for putting this together and for having me today. Um, a couple of words about Sustainable Finance Initiative, or SFI for short. Uh, we're based in Hong Kong. Uh, we are a community of family offices, private investors, a couple of corporate VCs as well, uh, mainly based in Asia. And they're all committed to you know, deploying capital towards sustainable, uh, sustainable finance and impact topics in general. Um, our members are primarily looking for early stage ventures, usually C to Series A, Series B type of territory, and also um, VC funds and private equity funds. We also look at other um, asset classes a, a bit opportunistically, let's say. Um, since our members are based mainly in Asia, we tend to help them find opportunities primarily in Southeast Asia and greater China. And then in terms of uh, impact thematic areas, we uh, mainly look at climate, food and agriculture, built environment and healthcare. Um, on top of that, we also do uh, ecosystem building activities. So we, we do a lot of uh, um, educational events or um, um, you know sessions uh, through our ad tech platform um, here in Hong Kong and also online. And uh, yeah, I'm always uh, looking for uh, interesting companies, so I'm looking forward to the pitches. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you, Francesco, for joining. So as you guys understand now, there's a lot of money around the table today. Uh, and this is just the tip of the iceberg, uh, because actually within the audience, we also have a lot of uh, interesting uh, angel investors and family offices. I can recognize a few names. So thank you for joining. You are part of the people who are not here for greenwashing, but really walking the talk. And thank you for that. Uh, so without further ado, uh, we're going to start to introduce the startups. Uh, and today we have a great selection of, of, of climate tech companies that are uh, are, being, are going to be pitching. So we start now and then we'll be ending at six sharp. Uh, how it's gonna go? It's very simple. Uh, we will go with five minutes presentation for each uh, founder and five minutes Q&A. And our team member shopper here will be doing the clock. Uh, so please make sure to be sharp uh, and, uh, and, um, and continue the discussion using the Slack group. So this is really where the power of Slack uh is 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 coming through uh you can continue the discussion on on the fundraising channel which we're going to share a link right now uh and feel free to have you know more in-depth discussion with the investors uh through that channel all right let's get started shopper you're here david you're here yes yes i am wonderful okay cool so um i think we can we can go ahead whenever you're ready david 
Of course. Uh, I want to say, boy, am I glad I'm going first. It is 1.30 a.m. here in San Diego, California. So, uh, Thank you for sleeping late for us. <laughs> of course, more than worth it. So Airbute is creating carbon offset independence through decentralized carbon sequestration. As governments around the world move to net zero, over 90 countries have committed so far. The companies that operate in those countries have to offset their unavoidable emissions or face penalties. To offset those emissions, these companies purchase carbon credits. In 2021, one carbon credit was selling for $4.43. This year, one, natu one nature enabled carbon credit is selling for about $80 and it's predicted to go up to $350 by 2050. And companies need millions of these credits and spend millions purchasing these credits. Airbut is taking the power from this $2 trillion market and handing it over to our customers. We have designed a panel that combines the carbon sequestration ability of the green roof through algae and enhance that with the energy generation of solar, combine that into a panel, and that's our product. So our product is equivalent in carbon sequestration to 15 trees, but we also generate energy and filter wastewater because algae can be used for water detoxification. We track every parameter in this environment to accurately and precisely report our impact, not only to our customers, but to the government for compliance and to the public for transparency. We've done select case studies of our panels in an, in an array to show how they would present. So these panels are installable anywhere, from building facades to rooftops to parking structures. And you can see the impact and the profitability of these panels as they generate carbon offset credits year after year, as opposed to going to the market to buy at market rate. So our business model, we see ourselves as the Q rig of carbon offsets. Instead of going to a coffee shop to buy a cup of coffee at their price, you can grow yours using us as your Q rig and generate that at a way lower cost. Um, so we sell our panels to B Corps, governments, or carbon emitters, and then charge them like a subscription model for maintenance. I am David Gori, co-founder and CEO of Airbeat. Uh, as you can see, we have a fully stacked team. Our team consists of engineers, visionaries, and a PhD holding biologist holding multiple patents and publications. We've worked for a variety of organizations ranging from Tesla to Homeland Security to Parker Hannifin. And individually, we've held this impact-focused mission close to our hearts, and together we're beyond motivated to see this to fruition. We started this company in 2021. We got into Techstars, uh, that's where I'm currently in San Diego right now. Uh, we, we've partnered with universities like the University of Massachusetts and a lab out in Portland, Maine, Bigelow Labs. We've received $75,000 from the state of Massachusetts. We've built out our MVP and is currently undergoing lab validation at uh, University of Massachusetts. We've, we're, we're, we've uh, organized contracts, well, conversations with the port of San Diego and the port of Portland for our pilot location. We've also tentatively secured two more pilot locations here in San Diego and plan to launch Q2 2024. Join us in building a greener future. You have my uh, contact info on your screen. Thank you. Wonderful pitch, David. Super interesting text. Um, judges, do you have any questions? Yeah, my, my question would be around, uh, hi, David, and thank you for the, the presentation, first of all. Um, my first question will be uh, the, the channel of distribution. How do you, how do you, how are you going to distribute? And, um, and your seems to be on a very competitive uh, um, market of this solar panel and so on. So how are you gonna differentiate yourself from, from the others? Uh, we, we, we differentiate ourselves by positioning ourselves not as a solar company, but as an alternative to purchasing carbon credits. Because when you purchase these credits, you buy them and you, keep, you have to continue buying them year after year. With us, 
you can buy these panels and then grow your own offsets. And you can also offset your emissions at the source of creation. We also have different products in our pipeline that we plan to test that with our lab partner. And one of them would just integrate with your existing solar. So we don't have to provide the energy generation. We will just provide the carbon sequestration in the same position that you already generate energy. All right, question on my side. Um, so we're super interested in, in the built environment, decarbonization and adaptation with, with our fund. So, so um, solar, of course, you know, is, is a big deal. We, we invested in Zoban, uh, who is doing uh, green roofing, uh, also based in, 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 in the US. And one of the things we've learned is um, the actual cycle for solar panels can be quite short, right? We're talking about eight to 15 years. So so how is that working? Because you're combining water and algae, uh, which probably are intensifying um, that that uh, that oxidation process. So maybe can you tell us a bit about that and what, what's the what's the average longevity of your of your your product? Thank you. Uh, our, our projected LCA right now is about 20 years, and that's because of the uh, polycarbonate that we've chosen to use. And we also have sheets inside the polycarbonate panel to increase the longevity of the panel. Since we monitor the environment completely with sensors and our IoT side of things, we can tell when a panel, you know, when, when a sheet is broken or when it's when it's getting toxic. And then we can just go out there and change that panel because it's a very modular design. Very interesting. Okay. Um, any other questions? All right, um, cool. Um, sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I think Amel had a question first. Yes. Um, can you can you um, describe a bit more the use case that you have on the port and uh, or the pilot uh, that you launch on, on ports and uh, what are the results? Uh, so we haven't launched those pilots yet. We're in conversations with them right now, and we plan to. We've already gotten port of Portland. We're in conversations with Port of San Diego, and we plan to launch those pilots Q2 2024. Okay, so what what, what is exactly the use case and uh, what uh, result are you expecting? Uh, the use case is more about scalability because we plan right now we're testing with four panels, right, in the lab because, you know, it's a small setting. With the port, we plan to test with 20 to 50 panels. And once we get that, we're now getting real world validation to show that this is scalable and this works. And then we plan to scale out to our next pilot of about 100 or just commercialize from there, depending on the data that we get. Uh, maybe a quick one from my side on uh, I, I didn't get the uh, if there is any like IP around this, uh, this technology uh, to kind of protect you from uh, you know, competition. Yes, uh, we have a pending patent right now for our panels. Um, all three designs, and we hope to fully fledge those panels in the coming months. Sorry, fully fledge those patents in the coming months. All right, thank you, um, David. Congratulations on the funding from Techstars, by the way, that's a great accelerator. Um, yes. And looking forward to have you uh, interacting in our Slack group. Feel free to share your presentation so you know more questions can come in and remember that we have uh, we have more than 200 uh, investors in that slack group among the 500 members we have so so yeah hope you guys can uh, can connect the dots here all right awesome thank you very much uh next up we have a nature's principle jan are you here yes uh, it's me hi hey there so whenever you're ready uh, sorry come again you can start whenever you're ready. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Also nice to see that the panel is so focused on, on uh, sustainability and climate change. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate that. So I'm Jan Peter. My name is very Dutch. I live in the Netherlands, but I'm actually Brazilian. My background is chemistry and petroleum engineering. And I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, this one. So I'm going to present today for you uh, nature's principles, and we are focused on lactic acid production from a new technology that I'm going to tell you how. But first of all, we all talk about uh, uh, carbon emissions and how to make the 
the whole carbon production more uh, clean. But what we don't talk about that often is that 84% of our uh, carbon production nowadays is from fossil based uh, chemicals, which means that if we reach 2050, uh, without any fossil based, we need to reinvent the whole industry because 84% of the production will be just gone. Then we need so many options, so many alternatives to, to uh, tackle this problem that, uh, but we need to separate which ones really make sense. And for us, what makes sense is to be, focus on the bio-based chemicals because the technologies are, are ready to scale so that we can really make a change as fast as possible. And then we keep on uh, researching on other uh, more uh, uh, future uh, possibilities later. And uh, the key, one of the key chemicals for us uh, uh, to, to support this, this, uh, this change is lactic acid. It's been used for so many things in biopolymers, preservatives, biocide solvents. It's, being, it's already replacing oil and gas in many alternatives. And it's, that's why it's so uh, much of a, a growth market. Nowadays, uh, it's around 3 billion. It's going to reach 6 billion by 2030, 8% growth. And uh, because of also every time we see other, other applications being developed for the, for the molecule. And also we chose this molecule because we can make it better. We can reduce 30% of, of the OPEX uh the production uh, costs on the production of this this molecule because without technology that is patented we started in delft university in in the netherlands uh we we are flexible we are agnostic on the feedstock so instead of using refined sugar instead of using uh corn syrup in the in the us uh here uh, uh in thailand uh, uh, crystal sugar we can use side streams residual streams from the industry or even cellulosic material to to ferment this and and produce lactic acid and this with this we can reduce 40 to 70 percent the the sugar feedstock cost and not competing with food you know sugar competes with food so why should we use sugar to produce our our chemicals in our daily basis so the, the, there's a lot of discussions going on about it and we can solve this discussion. And um, so we see our technology as groundbreaking because we can really change the, the way we produce lactic acid nowadays. All the industry is using sugar. We don't need that. We don't need to compete with food. We don't need to refine the sugar that much. Uh, uh, and use all this energy to do that. And, uh, and because of that, we decrease so much the, the cost of production that we can even be profitable on a, on a size of two to five kilotons instead of 75 to 250. And this is what we want to do on our demo plant. Our demo plant is two to five kilotons uh, and it can be profitable, which is already groundbreaking. And uh, so we already did our pilot we have our facilities in Rotterdam nowadays on the industrial area and we tested sugar beets the raw sugar beets and we got good results now we are we are going for lactic acid producers to make joint ventures to produce in large scale but first first uh, before that we want to build our demo plant for a beachhead market produce 120 tons uh, already next year and go into 2,000 tons by 2028, and then go for the flagship plant, five, uh, 55 kilotons, uh, using our technology. This is our team. We are two co-founders and directors. I'm Jan Peter. Jules Rumbaut is, is the PhD that developed this technology in Delft University. And we are five FTE full-time, um, focused on fermentation and chemistry. And we also have our, our mentors, advisors. They're also in the industry uh, on, uh, on, uh, on financials and, and on lactic acid production. So this is us. We, we produce biochemicals. They are naturally sustainable using the principles of nature. If you feel a fit uh, with, with what we are going for, please reach out to me. Thank you so much, Jan. Uh, and this is a pleasure to have you when, when we were looking at uh, the deal flow for this month call, 
um, we ask around, you know, for each company, do you know them? Are they legit? And people told us this is uh, the Netherlands next potential climate tech unicorn. So, you know, uh, excited to, to have you guys here. Um, I will start with a question. We, we invested in a similar company um, in, in, in France for our last fund investments for fund one, literally two months ago doing a uh, linear right so also right. Uh, decarbonizing those heavy chemical industry and one of the things that that have been a, a learning point for us was that actually decarbonization comes also with a cost uh, so very often you know decarbonizing a molecule that is heavy uh, heavy used in the industry also comes with a maybe 30 percent 40 percent price tag a compared to natural uh, I mean, not the natural, the, the oil-based mm -hmm. product. So can you tell us a little bit about those unit economics? How do you foresee that for plant one, plant two? And, and, and how is that uh, competing in, in that space? Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, you were very on the point. Usually chemical companies, they start with a premium. They can be very high because uh, it's really about how much you produce. If you produce a lot and the price really drops, if you are starting on the demo, then the price needs to be high. But we see that in terms of, of partnership, uh, we still we still need a higher price on, on the start, but the way we are changing the economics is we are not, for the demo plant, we're not going for very refined lactic acid. We're going for a beachhead market that can take a uh, very rough uh, lactic acid with a high price. At the same time that we don't need to use refined sugar so we are also decreasing the the cost of feedstock 50 percent or even higher uh, even uh further so with this economics that's how we can make our first plant that is not that big or already profitable but once we reach the big plant then we need to go to refine lactic acid because that's what the industry wants and then uh, then what dif uh, differentiates us to the market is the technology that can take the different feedstock and then decrease the price of, of, on the feedstock and then we can decrease the price of the whole production and then in this case we're not going for a higher price even though the product is more sustainable we are going for a lower price uh, because the production cost is actually lower okay very well Thank you. Judges, questions? Yep, go ahead, Francesco. Uh, yeah, just a quick one. Um, I was wondering like how difficult it is for, you know, um, existing uh, plants, for example, to kind of adapt to your technology. Is it is it easy? Is it like a drop-in solution or is there is it cumbersome to, uh, to adopt your technology? Wonderful. <clears throat> on the fermenters, it's a drop-in solution because uh, we don't need a very elaborate fermenter. Usually the ones that are in the market, they are actually way more elaborate than we need. And uh, But in terms of downstream process, it depends on the feedstock. Because if they are using very pure sugar and all of a sudden they start using a, a rough uh, a residual stream from, let's say, orange peels, then then they need to make a different refining. And these need some adaptation. So it depends, and it also depends on which kind of product they want in the end, if it's very pure or not. If it's for bioplastics, then it's very pure. They need to adapt the plant. But, uh, yeah, it's gonna depend case by case. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you so much, Jan. Uh, please, um, don't forget to share more details on the Slack group in fundraising channel so we can continue asking a bit more discussion uh, points. Uh, and thank you for, so much for your presentation. Next up, mm -hmm. uh, we'd like to get a little bit more into the food space. Uh, Mo, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Hello. I'm really excited. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to share the presentation right now. Awesome. Whenever you're ready. One second. Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yeah. Okay, 
Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mo. I'm the co-founder of Happy Grocers. We are basically a team of passionate young Thai people. Uh, my, me and my co-founder, we have uh, experience in social entrepreneurship. And then we were with MIT for a while training uh, specifically on basically working with international tech teams to work with local farmers in Thailand. And our agricultural scientist also has a decade of experience in agricultural innovation as well. So um, I'm going to do this a little bit differently than everybody else. I'd like to take you, I want to invite you to kind of like imagine this with me. Imagine if uh, you get to go to this forest uh, organic coconut farm with me and basically encounter the smiley farmers who is really happy to harvest every single piece of coconut for you. And then you basically have like a really big sip of sweet and juicy coconut. Um, I want to ask you a few questions. What does it feel like if you know exactly who your farmers are and know exactly that this piece of coconut is from a fair trace process? What does it feel like to know that this is completely 100% pesticide free? And what does it feel like to know that every single sip that you have of this coconut water actually allow you to be a part of the global carbon removal movement? Um, I'm really excited to say that this is not just a dream anymore. This is something that customers across Thailand actually have an experience with. And we actually have over 90,000 organic certified farmers and around 600,000 acres of land in Thailand that you can also have similar experience with as well. And uh, yeah, this is a reality that we have every day at Happy Grocers. We are basically a startup focusing on sustainable grocery delivery. And basically we turn every single delicious bite into a step for carbon removal. And uh, our key to sustainability is our short supply chain where we have direct relationship with our farmers across Thailand. And our farmers basically um, consolidate we would basically consolidate the product in our warehouse in Bangkok and then basically work with multiple types of consumers from individuals to restaurant to hotel to offices. This allowed us to be able to ensure that we know exactly where our food comes from, our farmers get paid fairly, and also consumers would also have um, reasonable price for clean and sustainable products as well. Hi, this is really simple. Um, you can Try to play with our platform on this QR code right here with your phone as well. Uh, but you can choose products from 20 different categories and then pay online and basically sit back at home and get the delivery from that will come from cute, uh, plastic-free, eco-friendly packaging as well. And let's talk about why what makes Happy Grocer different than other grocers. So something that we hold as our priority is our claim when it comes to clean and sustainable food. Something that we are working on every day is to make sure that consumers can really feel that they can trust in the quality of our product. So we don't just trust on the certification, but we really, we really look at the scientific soil uh, lab test. And also we share this information about um, product origin, um, agricultural practices and also impacts of the food to consumers as well, so that consumer can make um, informed choices. And something that's really the heart of Happy Grocers is our effort to support farmers to be able to go through the transition to become regenerative. Something that we have gathered as our skills and knowledge for the last three years that we have been in the business is our understanding when it comes to the bio waste across Thailand. And this effort basically get us into the space to turn bio waste into biochar to create affordable and natural agricultural inputs for Thai farmers to reduce costs. And we basically became the enabler for biochar projects in Thailand as well. So we are in the process of signing contract with companies from Switzerland and also Australia as well who have um, offtake agreement with Carbon Future and Pure Earth as well. We also do restoration projects where we work with farmers in the north of Thailand who used to grow corn for animal feed, which involved a lot with burning practices. And basically we turn them into organic farms that allow them to use only 30% of the land instead of 100%. And then the 70% of the land, we basically turn that into a forest. Um, and also our newest project is that because we put a lot of process and work into monitoring and auditing our claims when it comes to clean and sustainable food. We basically have an opportunity to also measure the carbon content in the soil as well, 
where we basically are developing a project to turn this into another carbon credit project as well, so that farmers that are already doing sustainable practices in Thailand could also get um, compensated for the practices that they have been doing for years. So this enabled us to have like a really unique positioning in the market because we not only just in the grocery delivery in Thailand, but also in the carbon credit market as well. And the traction so far that we have, so the last three years we have been um, relying on our grocery model to be profitable since day one. And uh, basically we have inbound um, contacts from multiple countries and in the process of signing agreement for export products uh, from our farms to the UK, Singapore, and also in Germany as well. And yeah, so for the last three years, we basically have been working with around 200 plus plus farmers and also save a bunch of food waste and also reduce so much plastics into the process as well. And yeah, our ask today is that we are raising um, $430,000 for 15% of our company. And yeah, again, we are Happy Grocers, a sustainable grocery delivery startup, turning every delicious bite into a step for carbon removal. This is my email, so if you have any uh, questions or want to chat more, please feel free to reach out. Wonderful. Thank you, Mo, for this uh, presentation. And uh, I, can, I can feel the taste of that <laughs> coconut now. All right, judges. Um, yep. Hi, Mo. Uh, thanks a lot for the presentation. I just have a quick one uh, on the um, supply chain. You are you you told us like you have a short supply chain um, on on your your goods. Uh, are you using like um, sustainable uh, transportation means for for your goods like uh, immobility? Yeah. So something that we kind of like would love to explore is to have that option as well. But because we work with farmers directly most farmers, they would drive to our warehouse, right? And mm -hmm. usually they own uh, diesel trucks. Okay. And it's quite hard to find any options with e-mobility that would be able to carry t three tons of goods as well and travel from like the north to Bangkok, which takes 10 hours. Yep. Okay, yeah, uh, for sure. Definitely uh, the, the range might be uh, an issue, but uh, I was maybe wondering from uh, uh, like short distances, there are like uh, last mile delivery, like uh, electric vans or uh, and I know that there is a good momentum for um, electric trucking and uh, hydrogen trucking also in Thailand, so that's why. Yeah, I, I, is your question around more of like the last mile to consumers? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so um, I have to say that we try to have our team super, super lean so that we have more um, capital to invest in like research and development. So we work with third party uh, fleet, so like Food Panda, Grab and stuff like that. Okay. So most of the time, I think like around like, 45% of the time they come with uh, e-bike, but that's really okay. outside of our control. Okay, you can look for it. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you. Hello, I'm Narapum from PTT. And oh, I, have, I, have, I have one question, which is, as your, as your presentation is, your attraction is, how does your rev revenue come from, which is from, it is from like, selling your organic food or is this from the carbon credit because you are doing about them right yeah so uh, for the last three years the majority of our revenue come from the sales of uh de delivery boxes so the sale from the products we actually also do marketing in a way that kind of help us generate money as well so for example we have the grocery truck that goes around bangkok in 25 locations right now we also do a lot of like education workshops in school. We also do a lot of tourism as well as a way to raise awareness about the topic. And uh, around like 10% of the revenue also come from there. The revenue when it comes to the carbon credits uh, is something that would start to happen next year because all these projects just started to kick off just only half a year ago. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mo, um, and same for everyone else. Uh, please, you know, engage on this. Oh, we have a last question. No, we're good. All right. Uh, so please engage in the Slack group for the interaction with the investors. I'm sure there's a lot of people who want to help here. So, yeah. Thank you All right. Much. Next up, uh, we're going back into the deep tech uh, in biofuels. Joannes, are you here? Yes, I am. Good morning or good evening. 
Um, I say uh, decarbonizing the trucks, uh, biofuel guys, um, that keeps the truck in, in business and just needs a little update. All right. So uh, CH4 um, is going to produce an alternative to fossil fuels um, based on seaweed. And that is predominantly bio LNG and e methanol for the maritime market. So, for the two CMA CGM people here, we're doing something very similar to the Salamander plant in Den Haag, only a different feedstock. And uh, how is it important for the rest? We are exclusively wanting to farm seaweed in ponds along desert shores in Africa. So, we're really yielding, the, harnessing the sun. Um, but it is for the Asia to Europe vessel transport to decarbonize that. And particularly with Singapore being the global's bunker hotspot, um, Asia is much of import to us. Um, the basic technology is, as mentioned, um, farming of seaweed in ponds um, as biomass and then converting that into biogas and regular anaerobic digestion. And the returning biogas is then going to be split into methane and CO2. And the CO2 will be used to be synthesized into e-fuels alongside with the emerging green hydrogen market, which in Africa is exploding. Um, whereas the methane is ready to go, it just gets liquefied and pops your uncle. Um, what the advantage is of what we're doing compared to many other biofuel solutions, we're not taking up arable land, um, we're not taking up food source directly, and because we're in the um, we're farming in ponds, not offshore the seaweed, we can feed the waste stream back into the ponds, short circuiting the nutrient cycle, which has all sorts of benefits on the monetary and impact side. Um, so that's on the tech. Um, then we've got a team with a good hundred years experience in total. Um, between two team members, myself and one member, we've got uh, sixty plus years in the maritime business. We've got a, um, a PhD in seaweed farming. Um, our um, chemical engineer with biogas focus, um, she is becoming, she's in a program to become a future female leader in energy. Um, yeah, so that's our team. Um, we're currently raising um, seven and a half million euros development capital with the first drawdown thereof being a mere 100,000 um, euros. And that is because we've got um, a partnership secured to do our test farm in a working aqua farm. So we're merely raising the runway for the staff um, and, and the bit of lab work and so on. Um, that will happen in South Africa, just north of Cape Town. And then the next stage is a, bi is a pilot plant for which we've got development partners in Namibia who are themselves developing um, green hydrogen uh, capacity. So here we're already talking also with the Namibian Port Authority for um, conversion of the local tax um, to use our biofuel in the port so we can pilot the use as well as the, um, the project itself. Um, and with basically creating with our partners an entire research and development nexus in hydrogen, biofuel, e-fuel, and all together, and a whole lot of additional technologies to be developed later. Um, we recently won the EDF Pulse Southern Africa Award with the finals for the whole of Africa outstanding in January. And we are a pilot project with the International Maritime Organization on the decarbonization of shipping in South Africa. Um, and in terms of scalability, we can go just about to any low-lying desert shore around the globe, which means a little bit in Chile, but the majority is around um, Africa and um, the Middle East, obviously, a little bit in um, Australia. Um, but again, we're central in um, to the Africa such as central to the vessel traffic between um, Asia and Europe and uh, Europe and I hear some of the Asian countries too having now as of January um, included the vessel traffic into the emissions trade system including um, arrival and departure voyage we don't need to bring the fuel to Europe to sell it there at its at the carbon neutral component but we can actually bunker on site in Africa 
and the vessels can still valorize on the on the carbon neutrality. That's it. There is a sorry. The, the pitch deck is. I posted the link here and on Slack. There is a deck, but this one I did without. Thank you, Janice. Um, I like the style. You know, when someone pitch with the pitch decks, you know, they are raising. They have raised a lot of money already, and they're pretty confident. So, and I like that you also shared the deck on Slack. So you got to have the mechanism in head. So thank you for, so much for this. Judges, questions. Maybe I can go first with a, with a quick one on. Uh, oh, sorry, Leo, you you want to go first? No, no, please go ahead. All right, uh, a quick one on uh, uh, seaweed um, harvesting. Let's say, uh, is there any like um, unintended consequences on the environment uh, by you know uh, harvesting seaweed? And yeah, thanks. Yeah. No, so firstly, we're in ponds, so it's a controlled system. And then the seaweed we're using has got indigenous strains wherever we're going. So again, particularly um, responding to the shipping market, which have had a big lesson learned in transporting species uh, to other places in the world in their, uh, in their, in, 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 sorry, I'm missing the word now, uh, you know, in the, in the water, um, ballast water. Um, um, we're using local strains in a controlled environment. So even was the seaweed um, escaping, it is already occurring on the shore in its natural state. And I've got a picture actually where we're setting up our test farm. I took a picture from the sea where you can see the seaweed in the, in the sea with our test farm not even yet installed. So <laughs> we'll actually probably grab that and transplant it into our ponds. Got it. Thanks so much. Sure. So what are you looking for today? A hundred thousand euros, if I may. <laughs> okay, so you need more, more, more funds. You don't need a, a yeah, use case. We, we are still, we are still self-funded, um, but we've secured those partnerships. So we've now got a lot of things working, but we still need to get the team working and into employ. The team is working, but not for salary. <laughs> okay. When you will raise money, and if you need use case, you can come to me. Yeah, so that, that will be in our deck. The, the, the whole drawdown is, um, is explained. Um, we're, we're raising a total of seven and a half million, and the first drawdown is 100,000. Um, but that's when you, when you look at the deck, um, it's, it's, it's all in there. <laughs> so this is, this is, uh, something, oops, this is something important, I think, um, to, to double down here. <clears throat> we, with the coalition, we really want to, help conglomerate synergize with companies as well so you can pitch here for fundraising but also you might find clients and and potential piloting partners so really this is just a the connection right uh, and you know through the different accelerators or corporate venture capital we work with uh, hopefully uh, the companies pitching here will have more than just a, a small check all right. Any other oh, oh, we, we've got much more appetite, and um, we are also. That's a fair point that you mentioned. That we are looking very much for technology partners, particularly on the e-fuel side and so on. We're not aiming at developing that ourselves. There's others that are further. We're just going to get that on site from someone else. Right. Okay. So you have to register the box. You will be access to a large community of startups around All the right. world. All right. few cells as well. Cool. For the startup. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Johannes. Um, thank you. And next up, we're going back to the food. Uh, but this one is quite special. So uh, if you're here, David, uh, you can present whenever you're ready. All right. Well, um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> to everyone. I'm David Young, co-founder of Green Monday. Um, so I'm here based in Hong Kong. Um, very glad to e-meet most of you. So let me go to my presentation presentation deck. And and while um, David is setting up, I just wanted to let you know that we had the chance to meet him uh, last week in Hong Kong. And 
we were honored because that was also one of the company that was really recommended by everyone as Hong Kong future agri-food unicorn. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for, for joining, David. Sure, uh, it's my pleasure. So uh, are you able to see the screen? <clears throat> yep. Great. So um, we uh, founded um, 11 years ago, 2012, uh, in Hong Kong. And um, I think especially with COP28 just around the corner, um, this is going to be a major topic uh, globally about um, how food has to be part of the equation when it comes to climate. Um, and there are so many reasons that, you know, change of the food system is necessary. Um, so the way we take on this um, mega global challenge, I mean, we look at it from multiple angles. Uh, in the middle, you see Omni, Omni Foods, which is our alternative protein brand that uh, is already selling in about 20 markets globally, which I'll get more deeply into. We also create the movement called Green Monday, which is similar to Meatless Monday, uh, but with a broader scope on how to, you know, how companies, uh, you know, organizations can join an ESG movement. And then finally, also a digital platform that can put us at very consumer centric uh, people who are pro plant based lifestyle and diets, how they can join us um, and how we can use that as also part of the marketing to target a uh, very uh, target demographic. So our journey, the last 10 years, uh, really starting first with the movement and then our brand Omni debut in 2018. Um, and we're very proud to say that, you know, uh, you know, despite all the challenges with COVID, um, especially here in Asia, uh, Hong Kong with lockdowns and everything, uh, we've been making very good progress globally. Now with the Green Monday movement, I think the, this is part of our marketing in terms of how to educate and raise awareness uh, and you know, basically bring the movement into, uh, we can open any doors and um, bring the movement into any organizational company in the world. Um, and first, you know, as a thought leader uh, and also let, let, let people understand why you know, change is necessary. And then the next is how, uh, and that's where Omni comes in. Um, you know, Despite the fact that we are headquartered in Hong Kong, but we have a very global team, uh, our R&D is based in uh, Canada. We have uh, definitely a business development team in the US uh, and across APAC as well. So both on food service, such as McDonald's, uh, Starbucks, Ikea, uh, Disney, and on the retail side uh, in the US, Whole Foods, Sprouts, uh, Walmart, Albertsons, and then here in Asia, Dairy Farm, 7-Eleven, et cetera, um, are all you know, our products have already successfully uh, penetrate into those channels. Now with Omni in particular, um, we are proud to say that we have won numerous awards and uh, really a good blend and a balance of both, you know, innovation technology and of course, culinary excellence. What separate us from many other brands that you have heard of is we don't, although we have definitely the protein innovation, so whether it's you know beef, chicken, seafood, pork alternative, um, that's very important. But on the other hand, I think in today's environment, whether it's to see or to be, uh, everyone is looking at ready to eat. Um, you know, so solutions that you know basically are reheatable uh, and make it as simple as possible, both to the end user or even to many restaurants and cafes. All they have to do is put it in an oven or a microwave for 30 seconds, a minute, uh, and immediately you can serve restaurant quality gourmet food. Uh, Nestle recently just announced one of the investment, a big investment from Nestle, and that is on kind of ready to make items. Uh, and then in China, this is one of the biggest, most explosive uh, kind of segment of food that is growing. And it is all about uh, value added solutions and ready to eat. So that really separate Omni in terms of not just having the protein, but using the protein and put it into various, various kinds of, you know, whether it's, you know, appetizers, meals, um, you know, etc. These are some of the examples. I mean, in Hong Kong, uh, for some of you who are in uh, Hong Kong, uh, our product, the luncheon meat, uh, vegan luncheon meat is in uh, McDonald's every morning and our vegan tuna is in McDonald's McCafe all day. Um, these are some of our, um, you know, partners and retail channels in the US. Um, and, you know, just uh, if we list all of them, I mean, that itself would be quite a presentation. Um, we're very glad to say that we're up to anywhere, I think we're at about six to 7,000 points of sales in the US right now. Uh, and that continue to grow and we should be crossing the 10,000 points of sales mark uh, sometime in the first half of next year. 
just in the U.S. And some of these, uh, because we have our fish, uh, plant-based fish, so uh, indeed, we also have won a lot of awards and also become the go-to brand for uh, vegan uh, fish and chips and any uh, dishes using or featuring uh, seafood items. And finally, some examples of Greater China and Singapore as well. Um, you know, partners such as IKEA, Starbucks, we already are working with these uh, major, um, you know, food service chains uh, and in multiple regions. I think that also really is what separate Green Monday from other groups is we are already, um, you know, we have people on the ground and partners on the ground that can collaborate with a multinational group um, or, you know, in various regions. This is our manufacturing plant. We have two, uh, one is in Guangdong in Southern China. The other is in Thailand. Uh, the Guangdong one is the major one. And because we're doing a lot of sourcing um, regionally, we are able to, I think this is a very important point in terms of uh, pricing and cost. I think nowadays, um, one of the barriers is still, you know, alternative protein products are too expensive uh, and significantly higher than the meats that, you know, we are trying to reduce. Um, but with our supply chain very efficient, um, and we put a lot of uh, work in terms of sourcing and um, you know, understandings of supply chain, we're able to produce products at uh, price parity with meats, or in fact, very soon, um, you know, cheaper than the meats that we're trying to reduce. So this is a major milestone. And then finally, on digital, um, Happy Cow is uh, one of the go-to vegan uh, kind of food discovery app uh, with more than actually the 3 million is out there. It's more like 4 million app downloads, 15 million page views. And that give us a very important database of the most active uh, plant-based consumers globally. So um, how to connect kind of on an O2O, online, offline, uh, not just using traditional trade marketing to sell Omni products, but being very um, you know, demographic, consumer-centric, um, and then also leverage their own influence to share with more people uh, about uh, Omni products. So. Um, our way of engagement and marketing um, is very unique, and that is another major differentiating point from any other, you know, product-centric companies out there. Um, some of our accolades, awards, uh, our team, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, both uh, in Asia and also uh, in North America as well. So a very quick, you know, kind of a I don't know, was that six or seven minutes uh, presentation? And of course, happy to open up the floor for any questions. And after that, you know, uh, please reach out. I will clearly leave my contact um, on the chat and also in, uh, in Slack, but happy to open up to answer questions, uh, give you short answers. Thank you so much, David. Um, so David and I met uh, during our a coalition dinner in Hong Kong uh, two weeks ago. So this is the type of, you know, great startup, uh, really with an impressive track record that you can meet in the coalition. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just a bit sad that I didn't have the chance to invest on the pre-seed round. Um, but <laughs> anyway, uh, what, what round are you guys raising now? We are doing our extended Series B. So we are looking to raise an additional roughly 10 or ideally, you know, uh, 10 plus uh, million for our uh, business development. The good thing is that uh, the last few years we have finished our CapEx in, uh, investment. So now really it's about scaling the business. So, um, so yeah, roughly 10 to 15 million. Um, and, you know, we're humble to say that, you know, some of the, you know, world-class top-notch investors and groups are uh, in our cap table as well. So uh, as we get into more detailed discussion, I'm happy to share. Wonderful. All right. Um, judges, questions? And in the meantime, David, you can share your presentation into our Slack fundraising channel. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the question I have for you is, uh, is so you're talking about scaling and, and, and investing in, so you're looking to raise funds to do business development, right? So what is exactly your sales strategy? Because it seems that you have already, um, um, you're pretty much on the, the developing the American market, right? So what your, what your strategy, you want to go global, you, you want to continue focusing on the American market or? Well, we see um, what North America and Asia are, and 
those two uh, markets alone are already obviously huge enough. Um, for the U.S., I mean, uh, we are first focusing on retail. Um, so, you know, again, as I mentioned, Albertson, Walmart, Whole Foods, these are our products are already uh, on shelf um, and listed. Um, and we ex we plan um, to expand to over 10 to 15,000 outlets within the next nine months um, because we are already talking to many of the other chains such as, you know, Costco, uh, Kroger, etc. cetera. Um, and then simultaneously, we are also pitching food service. Now, food service, usually the sales cycle is much longer when you, you know, have to work with whether it's a McDonald's, Starbucks, you know, uh, Panda Express, for example, I mean, uh, is a longer process. So, um, but that is also simultaneous. Um, in terms of strategy, I think it's very important to highlight that, you know, as I mentioned, the meat alternative or the protein, um, on one hand, you know, we certainly believe, you know, we have outstanding products, but on the other hand, our ability to leverage the nimble and agile and efficient supply chain in Asia give us an edge of doing customized products for different clients. So for a lot of chains, I mean, what they want is not just a burger. I mean, just a, you know, cookie cutter product that, you know, you know everyone is selling the, the, the same products. So our ability to customize for major chains, especially food service on what they need, um, you know, a pret manger is not gonna need the same thing as a McDonald's or a Starbucks. So I think there are a lot of, nuances that separate um you know brands uh, and our uh, ability of execution from others and i think that you know for many brands out there um, because they are not they don't have that backbone of the efficient supply chain and r d they may not be and not to mention the cost effectiveness they may not be able to get those accounts but as we have proven already uh, we can work with many uh, multinational chains so uh, retail is an entry point, uh, but food service actually is really the part that can separate us um, from many of the of the other um, you know companies out there. When you said Asia, you mean China? Uh, definitely. So, uh, well, uh, we're headquartered in Hong Kong, but with our plant manufacturing plant in China right now, we are definitely also. Uh, you know, talking to, you know, every on an everyday basis. In fact, just a couple of hours ago, I was uh, meeting with the CEO of a major uh, chain, um, you know, and um, and now, of course, in terms of awareness and adoption, I do think, you know, China and Asia is a little bit, so Europe and parts of North America are probably uh, slightly ahead. So uh, we do need to do more of both uh, market awareness building and also, uh, kind of uh, more early stage kind of R&D with these companies uh, or potential partners. But at the end, of course, you know, the market in China is huge. And from a food security, um, you know, kind of sustainable solution standpoint, China arguably is going to be the biggest market maybe five or eight years down the road. Okay. Thank you. Um, do I, can I have a question, Shopper, or we don't have time? Yeah, we can have one question. Yes. All right. Um, um, so, 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 just uh, just to understand, right? I wanted to ask you that question last time. But uh, what is inside? <laughs> uh, what is what is what is that protein? Like, what is it? Like, what what, so what is inside? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, we have one of the cleanest label um, among all the brands out there. Uh, Non-GMO soy is you know where the protein is from. We do use a lot of mushroom, so uh, fungi base. And we, in the future stage of uh, R&D, actually, uh, we believe fungi and fermentation are going to be critical of the next frontier breakthrough. So um, soy, but, oh, I, and I need to highlight, non-GMO soy uh, and fungi, I think those are two important ingredients. But I think what is unique, of course, and that is where the IP comes in, is our proprietary formula, our patent technology of the vegan fats, um, that goes into the alternative meats um, and and then the culinary excellence uh, to put everything together. So um, so indeed, I think anyone uh, you know who has looked at our label um, in you know they they like the fact that we are clean label. Wonderful. Judges, any other questions? Hello. May know the cause, uh, unique cause of, may know the 
your unit cost. Yeah, unit cost of your product. Because you are saying you are saying that it will going to be a cost competitive in the future and may know the current cost now. Okay. So um on a wholesale, I mean, if we're talking about just the uh you know, let's say the the pork mince or the beef mince, um we are um doing wholesale anywhere from three to five dollar us per kilo okay so anyone anywhere from three to five uh us dollar per kilo uh on a wholesale basis now it depends on what grade of product you know our customer wants some want kind of the most mass uh kind of and on the cheaper end and that would be you know three us uh, or even a little bit below three i think so um that is um you know in china or in most countries you know basically parity with the meats that we're comparing if we're doing alternative beef um actually you know even at 455 us that is significantly lower than uh, the beef out there so from that standpoint um we are not only just achieving price parity for beef we are already um below price parity which means um you know companies if they switch to us it actually will be cost saving so the perceived value and the actual cost of beef of course is higher than pork so um so yeah i mean depending on product thank you okay done we good thank you so much david looking forward to see you again for the next uh, yes. day for the atlas coalition and uh, we have a few companies we would like to connect you with actually in our in our in our coalition uh, a few conglomerates um so we'll we'll reach out uh, directly okay All right. thank you okay pleasure next up uh, we have continent mv morgan and thomas yes guess. good afternoon everyone hello good afternoon um i'm very happy to to meet you all I'm sharing my screen. Do you see the screen? No. Can you? Not yet. Not yet. Window. Window. That's impossible. Superb. How to share screen? Okay. All right. Share the screen. All right, here you are. Do you see it? So, yeah, wonderful. Okay, excellent. So, did you know? I would like to start with um, a statistic from the International Energy Agency. Did you know that forty percent of the electricity globally, uh, the electricity growth between twenty 2020 twenty and 40 percent of this growth would be for air conditioning on the world. And this is a major challenge uh, to our carbon footprint worldwide. But luckily, uh, one of the wonderful solutions that have been developed and patented in Japan is Continuum. And this technology is, I would say, natural, long lasting, very sustainable because it is composed of minerals. A patent uh, ceramic is made out of these minerals from Japan. It's completely patented, fully, fully patented in Japan, but also in the US and in many countries where we are. Uh, today, this technology is bringing some very good results in Southeast Asia, in Japan, of course, for a long time. And what we achieve with our technology, when we install it in any HVAC system in cooling or heating, we achieve on average 25% saving on the power consumption of the HVAC system. But also we reach a better temperature homogeneity and lower temperature in the space where you use it. The space can be as various as uh, public buildings, offices, containers, wherever. We reach also thanks to one of the property of this patented ceramic that is the highly electronegativity. We naturally ionize the air and reduce 
PM 2.5 and PM 10 content in the air, which improve their quality where people breathe. Globally, our clients who use our technology are on an ROI between 18 to 48 months. There is a unique size of the product that we adapt by recutting it because we install it at the air return of any HVAC system. So it's very easy to adapt and we have only one production uh, size. It has been distributed in Japan for 12 years and outside of Japan for almost nine years now. And globally, it's more than 20 years of research and development. There is no need for maintenance, so you don't need to hire highly qualified engineers, so it can be installed in, basically in every uh, part of any country where access to a uh, to highly qualified engineer is difficult. It is very durable, more than 20 years lifetime without decrease into uh, the efficiency. And it's very fast to install. Our history, so the, the, the start of the sales in Japan after more than 10 years of research and development was in 2011. And we started to, uh, to sell in Thailand, starting in Thailand where my company is based. And since 2018, we progressively developed a network of distributor, sub-distributor in Asia, in Southeast Asia, starting by uh, Singapore, where we have our local distributor. And uh, last year, we start to grow a lot in, uh, in India, but also in Spain, in Vietnam, in Italy, in Europe. This year, we open in, uh, in Mexico, Canada, and in the US. Uh, thanks to our experience in the past uh, nine years in Southeast Asia, we gained the, uh, the exclusive rights to distribute and to develop the market with Continuum uh, in the in, in North America market. And that is thanks to our various references and clients. So you can see in the retail industry, supermarket, shopping malls, you might know some brands in the hospitality industry as well, healthcare, industrial, uh, like Capitaland in Singapore, but also Coca-Cola in Japan, uh, ITC in India, Swarovski in Thailand, public building, we have a lot of, um, of embassies over the world. And one of our biggest clients today is Amazon. They equipped already uh, 89 buildings with our technology, which represents 15,000 air conditioning units in Japan. And we are deploying in the US. Today, if, I, if we are here, is to, uh, to ask for investment to grow faster the market in the US. The market is huge. Uh, every building is cooled and heat with HVAC system. Here you have some, uh, some metrics and numbers about the, the, the potential market. And we already have set up our company in the US in April this year. We have first distributors in the US, and we are raising today uh, half a million US dollar to reach uh, our target next year of 2.1 million USD sales, and in 2035, at least 21 million US dollar of sales. And we will use these half million to, uh, to get local certification because uh, even though we are really data driven and we prove every of our performance and energy efficiency, uh, we need local certification that in the US uh, costs a lot, especially at the beginning when we launch the, the market. And we also need some, uh, some initial stock, uh, improve our website and, uh, and services and together with cash flow. We have a team for the US market that is composed of Jenny, who has been working with me here in Thailand for five years, so she knows very well. Now she is based permanently in the US. Uh, Morgan, who is based in uh, in Thailand and traveling a lot, is just coming back from the Maldives where to visit a client, and, uh, and in Europe, and myself as uh, VP Engineering. So that's it about Continuum, and we are looking forward to uh, to working with uh, with most of you. Wonderful! Thank you so much, Thomas. So. Um, Question: we, We're looking at the edge is you know, uh, ecosystem a lot with with Atlas since we're looking at uh, built environment adaptation and decarbonization. So, 
uh, I'm surprised you guys are not much bigger already because this is something that everybody is talking about. So yeah. um, the question is not why I want you guys bigger, but <laughs> maybe can you share with us in terms of the the, the marketing uh, and distribution? What what have been your strategy? Uh, is it only B two B? And 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 like, can you explain us a little bit? Like, what what have what what have this? Okay. What have been this process? Thank you. Uh, it's a vast subject. I will try to be uh, very short. So I think it's a mix of culture because the product is Japanese, and in Japan now uh, they sell about forty thousand units per month. So it's a, it's huge. I mean, the, the the it's growing very fast. But Japanese don't really need. When you uh, when you are Japanese, a Japanese company who want to uh, to save energy, and you have this technology arriving that is patented in Japan, they trust each other so much that they don't need any uh, proof of concept uh, testing and so on. And when I discover uh, when when I met the inventor and the owner of the patent, I was really shocked that it was not it was not available outside of Japan. But when you bring such a simple technology. It looks like this, and that brings so much results outside of Japan. You need to make a lot of engineering to prove the results. And every of our clients, we prove the results. It takes time. It takes a lot of energy. After eight years, now we have a database of references of certificates, like Singapore Green Building Council, uh, a lot in Thailand as well. But it takes time, and to uh, everything, our growth is 100% organic. And that's why now we are, we need to speed up because the planet needs us. And that's why we are here. I mean, it's all a matter of resources. You know, we need to train a lot of engineers because it's about knowledge, not only on the product, but on the environment of a track system, because uh, all our, uh, all our sales are really data driven. And every time it's metrics, measurement, and so on and so forth. So I think I, that's a little bit the the environment of where we have been uh, we're working for the last uh, decade almost okay thank you how how is the company structured i mean how many employees do you have and and where are they what are their roles i mean because i suppose that what you want to do is you want to distribute your product through existing channels right you, you, exactly you, want go, you don't want to go door to door right you want to go through somebody that has already uh that's maybe is distributing aircon already or so basically you 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 can see us as a master distributor outside of japan in japan they have 20 distributors okay we purchase directly to the manufacturer and we gain this exclusive right and basically today we have in, a, in Southeast Asia, we grew directly by distributor, local distributors, okay, local company who already have a market, uh, either on sustainability or te more technically on HVAC systems. In Europe, we are also uh, creating Continuum Europe to have a kind of central point, okay, where we can train distributor. We have distributor in Spain, in France, waiting in the UK, in Germany, uh, in Benelux, everywhere, and in the US. Same, we make we have a central uh, company that is the represent the, the main uh, how can I say master distributor for North America. We already have the, the distributors uh, in America, in Canada, and in Mexico. We have some segment the, the distributor as well, but this is the way we grow, and um, we thought that it is the the faster way to make this technology available everywhere. Okay. And the other question is if tomorrow you're gonna you you get to scale up so i don't know you plan 21 million right in 2025 or 61 million remember 21 21 in, what in if the us in what the if US, you you're in the us alone but what if it actually gonna be 60 or 100 how 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 do you how are you gonna supply the demand so in terms of supply for the product there is absolutely no limitation in terms of quantity of mineral. Uh, the production process has been already scaled up in uh, just after COVID last year in Japan. They multiplied by six the production capacity within a few months. It's not like if you have to build a new complete factory, a cement factory or so on. It's very simple to, to, to scale up. But indeed, the most important resource would be funds. And uh, we are not 
growing like we we could ask hundreds of million because we we, we could grow very fast but we have to structure and the, the the key point is to to develop the knowledge to our technical teams and engineers so we can assist you know it's it's a data driven uh, market and when you have to prove uh, the results uh, our clients are demanding and we have to be there and if we grow too fast we might not be able to to be able to prove that everywhere so we go step by step and i wish that coming back in two years asking for more millions okay john all right um thomas it seems like you guys need to find the right partner to go to the moon uh, let's <laughs> continue chatting <laughs> I have a question. Um, I, I don't understand um, exactly um, uh, the. Um, so you are developing the sales part, but uh, do you own the IP, the IP or the patents, or is it the Japanese company? So who, the ja is, who is raising money? Is it the Japanese company who has the IP and and the product, or is it you who want to develop and to scale? Uh, the commercial um, part so the ip is owned by the japanese company all right and it's us who are with raising the money today for the u.s market where we have exclusivity contracts with the japanese company okay so and if the exclusive uh, contract um, will break how do you, how you will manage i don't I don't imagine this situation uh, for the last uh, nine years working with them. Uh, you know, it's uh, we, we gained this exclusivity uh, in April 2023 when we start work from 2015 with them. Uh, it, it's, it's contractual and it's also cultural. I mean, working with Japanese, you have some trust. And honestly, I, uh, I don't imagine this situation. All right, time's up. Um, please, uh, Thomas, share uh, the presentation in the fundraising channel so yep, I will register. the other judges can continue uh, exchange and hopefully you will find one partner amongst the 27 different VCs and conglomerates in the Thank college. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, and next up, we have Cedric from Craft Block. Are you here, Cedric? Yes. Hello. Oh, you can't yeah. see me yet? But I hope this is, oh yeah, hi there. Good day, hi everybody. Um, yeah, I brought a presentation as well. Um, so um, what is CraftBlock? So first of all, I'm Cedric. I'm responsible uh, for communication here at CraftBlock. And as you can tell by the name, uh, we are sitting in Germany. Um, and what we do is to decarbonize heat. And uh, you've heard a bit about air conditioning now, but uh, we have a, a little bit uh, different in mind. Um, did you know that over 50% of the global energy is demanded as heat and it accounts for 40% of the global emissions? Most of it is in the industrial sector from food to steel. And what we do is take either waste heat or renewable power, store it to uh, make it available flexible in our thermal energy storage and deliver it to either the district heating network, to the industry itself, or even to generate power again in uh, existing infrastructure such, such as coal or gas-fired power plants. So our core product is the storage and the engineering system around it because the storage alone is pretty much a dump box who can do nothing if it's not integrated in a use case. So for example, taking renewable energy when it's available or very cheap, which makes a business case, store it for the continuous application in an industry, such as, for example, uh, drying vegan uh, mushrooms. So I think there's a use case there, definitely. Um, or, for example, in the steel industry, you have a lot of waste heat, about 50% is wasted, which can save uh, on primary energy use and thus avoids emission. 
Um, a bit about our storage, with, which is our core technology. Um, we have developed our material uh, for years. So we've been uh, founded in uh, 2014. We had a, a big development phase and uh, we have a stable material that is that goes up to 1300 degrees C. Um, and uh, what we do is we put it in a box, basically the dark box, as you see here, which can be scaled by simple copy and paste principle. Um, we store between hours and up to two weeks. So um, if you heard about the time we call here Dunkelflaute, um, which is the time where no wind is blowing and the sun isn't uh, shining, this is the um, space we can uh, bridge over. Um, a special, a special in our material is that is recycled up to 85% from steel slags. Steel slag is a byproduct of steel making, um, and it's very cheap because it's just sitting around in landfills, um, but very durable. So we tested it for 15,000 cycles. Uh, just for comparison, the battery storage has about 10,000 cycles before it needs to get changed. Um, and if you use our system once a day, um, it makes up over 40 years. Um, what do we do with it? So this, this is what we call net zero heat system. It's taking renewable power, uh, converting it to heat, storing it as, as heat and uh, deliver heat to as many processes as you can think. Um, this is the Volt project. It's in the Netherlands with PepsiCo and the Dutch energy supplier Eneco, where lace chips are produced for uh, eight European countries. Um, just uh, so you know, there's about 400 tons of potatoes going in every day, um, one million bags of chips. And chips are uh, very energy intensive to produce because they need to be fried at up to 300 degrees C. Um, this means 24 seven, this runs with a gas boiler. And what we do is take our system, uh, convert green power from wind turbines um, and install a storage to match cheap power and their demand. Uh, we replace a 22 megawatt boiler. Um, we save in a first step 4.5 million cubic meter of gas, uh, which equals 8,500 tons of carbon dioxide emissions. So we deal in factories and processes uh, as far as uh, in perspective of our scope. Um, for waste heat recycling, which is uh, very interesting for steel, glass, ceramic, um, uh, and cement, um, we have uh, a couple of projects. This is our pilot uh, established in 2019 in the ceramic industry, where uh, they have a batch process, meaning they burn something, then they need to change the equipment they need to burn. And in between, this uh, process loses a lot of uh, heat and they need to preheat the oven again, which they now do from our storage system, um, which saves the gas to preheat. This is uh, a plant um, we are building right now in India, in the steel industry, where we are in a center plant um, collecting uh, waste heat and uh, using it again there. And this is a EU finance project where we are taking flare gas. So if you ever saw a steel industry, there's a big flare there um, up in the air, uh, burning uh, valuable energy. And this energy is actually so big that it could provide energy and heating for millions of households in the EU. And what we do is we uh, really try to get those 1100 to 1400 degrees C tested and move to our own production hall to replace heating. Um, this is already it. This is my contact info, which I uh, leave here and on Slack. And uh, I'm sure there are some questions. Yeah, thank you, Cedric. Um, wonderful application. Uh, I think I think most people talk about EVs, uh, where me and a few friends are always talking about heavy industries like this one. So I'm really happy to see you guys pitching today. So in in terms of the the heat capacity of, of absorption of your material, can you explain us a bit? What what is this material, right? What's uh, what's the component exactly? Yeah, yeah. So um, there are many materials uh, available to store heat. Uh, a simple example is sand. So when you are in summer at the beach, the sun is shining on the sand. Of course, you see um, or you feel that the sand is hot. However, if you dig in a bit, 
then it's not hot again, it's cool. And our material solves the issue that below the surface, there is energy as well stored. So if you want to have a thermal energy storage material uh, with a good capacity, it needs to be uh, heated evenly and it needs to be charged and discharged very quick to uh, deliver uh, process heat to industries which are tacked it fast. So we developed a material that is based on steel slags or glass slags, um, which I said is a very cheap material um, available everywhere where there's heavy industry, um, such as steel. Um, we have some additives and a um, self-invented binder, which binds the milled down uh, powder to a pellet. So at the end of the day, it looks a bit like a pebble stone, uh, very dark and gray, and uh, it dries at the air. And then um, we can do basically uh, round shapes, uh, squares, uh, blocks, whatever the business case is. We uh, customize or can customize our material for the use case. Oh, I don't hear you. Yeah, just one last follow-up question on my side. Um, uh, any any potential uh, partner in, in Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Indonesia that you've been discussing with, like industrials? So uh, we are basically rolling out global. I mean, it's uh, project-based plant engineering, so it's not like... Um, uh, a B2C field, um, but we are talking globally. So we uh, had Australia, India, and um, recently, so in the summer, we had a funding round um, where a Redstone VC invested in us, which is um, the European arm of SPI uh, from Japan. So, of course, um, we are thinking globally and um, we are already uh, ready to deliver and uh, build wherever. Okay, please share your presentation in fundraising channel. We will use that to connect you with two conglomerates we have in mind. Yeah, judges, any questions? Um, can I can I go first? Maybe uh, I'm a bit of a one trick pony, but I had a question on. Uh, uh, you mentioned a binder. Um, I was wondering if there is any you know like harmful materials or chemicals released in the process. And also, my second question is um, at the beginning. I think you mentioned that you. Basically, you store the power, and then that can be used for like uh, coal power plants as well, or gas power plants. And I was wondering if you plan to kind of like, uh, you know, decrease the amount of uh, those type of plants that that you're um, uh, providing energy to, or if that's a plan for 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 the long run. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so for the first question, we um, very carefully de uh, develop our material to be sustainable. So there's no harmful uh, things, whatever. You could even heat it up and barbecue with it, um, which we did. <laughs> so uh, there's really no worries. Um, it's completely recyclable again. And um, yeah, so we, we look for that. Um, yeah, so we don't store power directly, but convert it to heat which is very efficient, the conversion itself. So you lose about one or 2% of the energy from power to heat. Um, what we do is, for example, we, had a, we have a study uh, in Australia with AGL. We have a study with a German and an Austrian um, uh, power uh, supplier. Uh, is what we look at is how we can re refurbish existing uh, generation assets such as gas or coal-fired power plants to either um, give some uh, or create some base load, which is necessary in the grid, or um, have flexible um, power generation abilities. Um, so this is a specific use case which makes um, sense uh, with different uh, factors. For example, in Australia, there's so much cheap solar energy they waste that it might make sense to store it for later to uh, avoid gas and the emissions of gas. So we are. This is uh, something we talk with the big guys. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thanks. All right. Um, Right, so let's keep that discussion on Slack now. Um, we want to stay on, on track for the time. So yeah, uh, Cedric, thank you so much. Um, I'm looking forward to have your presentation on fundraising channel. And yeah, um, thank you for the invitation. Next up, uh, we have Dylan from New Earth Solution. Are you here, Dylan? Hmm. Shopper, is Dylan ready? I cannot see him here, so you can okay. call the next one. Let's let's go with uh, Indeed then. Uh, Akash, are you here?
All right, Akash from India. Hello, Canada. hello everyone. Uh, a very good evening. I, I am not sure. <laughs> yeah, a very all good right. evening to all. Yeah, we can hear you, and you can start whenever you're ready. Yeah, just one sec. One minute. Can you see my screen? Hello. Yep, yeah, we can see your screen. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much uh, for inviting Indie Energy. So this is Akash Soni, co-founder and CEO of Indie Energy. So we are energy storage startup based uh, from IIT Roorkee, India, working towards uh, uh, sodium and batteries and these components development for applications like solar, wind, electric mobility, etc. So as you all know, uh, there's a huge challenge in in, in, in comes to scaling of the global battery industry, the main reason being the few resources availability for lithium. And we have to rely on importing of the lithium because of the geographic unavailability. And the best solution right now is really sodium and batteries, which are made from earth abundant materials and can deliver performance equivalent to lithium and batteries uh, at low cost. So, I mean, we are working on developing the sodium ion batteries, uh, which can deliver performance at low cost. Uh, this is a sodium ion cell uh, completely indigenous and developed by us. Uh, we not only work on the uh, battery cell development side, Indian Energy is an end to end solution right from developing materials and cell technologies for sodium ion batteries. And our sodium ion batteries uh, delivers, uh, made from low cost earth burning materials. Have a same battery design compared to lithium ion batteries. Uh, they are much more sustainable. They are actually much more safe uh, compared to uh, lithium ion batteries. And we are developing this technology for applications like EV two wheeler, three wheeler, uh, batteries for solar and wind energy, UPS inverter batteries, SLI batteries, smaller applications, solar lanterns, solar sheet light, etc. So Indian Energy works on the, both aspects. Uh, we work on the cell development as well as the component development simultaneously for sodium and batteries. And right now we are also working on making packs to demonstrate for the application, as I mentioned. Uh, our first innovation is the use of agricultural waste uh, to make a very high quality hard carbon uh, for sodium and batteries. Uh, we have achieved the highest capacity in hard carbon, and we used agricultural waste like rice straw, wheat straw, sugarcane bagas, etc. A technology patented by Indy Energy, we have filed uh, and got granted both Indian and international patents. We are currently only working company in India working working towards su supplying this low cost, high quality hard carbon uh, with a pilot plant running at IIT Roorkee. Uh, we are already supplying this material uh, to some of our customers in US and Europe, and a few customers in Sweden actually, uh, like company like Altis, have given a very good given us very good feedback as this is one of the best hard carbon they ever tested in sodium and batteries. So it shows that the quality of our technology and also uh, and how we can compete in the global market. Our second innovation is a very important innovation. We have developed our own cathode also. See, in a battery, you know this anode, cathode, electrolyte, and combine them to create a battery cell. So this is a, a, a earth abundant material based sodium and cathode with no use of lithium, cobalt, or nickel uh, is capable of charging the charging at a uh, high rate we have already tested over 3c rate and performs really well over long uh, cycle life is another technology patented by indian energy and we combine these to create uh, india's first indigenous sodium and battery cell and um, completely made in locally available materials uh, this is a 3.2 volt 1000 mh capacity cell which we already tested one uh, which we already tested over 1000 cycles with over 80 percent capacity tension Right now, we are working on two aspects. First is making battery packs uh, for this uh, sodium and batteries. A second is is improving the cyclability and, and the quality of the battery cell uh, that comes out of the energy. In terms of product differentiation, uh, so our technology competes with LFP technology and ladders and batteries in terms of energy density, almost equivalent to LFP batteries. 
of similar cell voltage and working on improving the cycle life to reach cyclability till LFP technology. The the cost on on a cost factor we estimate up to thirty twenty to thirty percent cheaper than uh, LFP batteries on almost uh, on one point four times better, but cost of ownership wise much much cheaper than lead acid batteries. So we aim to replace both technologies for different different industrial application. Uh, on a broader context, uh, uh, other battery technologies. Uh, we also compete with redox flow batteries and aluminum battery along with the uh, LF fuel LS battery in terms of uh, energy density, cyclability, uh, rechargeability, cost, uh, using earth abundant materials, down trip efficiency, etc. Uh, in terms of global competitiveness, uh, Indian Energy is one of the few companies who are actually working and providing end to end solutions right from developing materials to cell technology and also battery pack for sodium and batteries. Uh, and, uh, and we believe that uh, soon uh, this technology would really showcase its ability uh, to replace uh, light acid battery, lithium ion batteries going forward. Uh, I mean, these are. We are planning to unveil our product in the next two weeks uh, to showcase in a, in a smaller application and, and simultaneously moving towards bigger application going forward. In terms of achievements, uh, we have filed over 15 patents uh, in various aspects of sodium and batteries. Few patents already granted to us. Uh, we have filed all aspects of uh, sodium and battery, including the anode, cathode, electrolyte, and the battery cell. Uh, we have received investment up to $2 million recently by a big capital group uh, from US and Vietnam and also from Indian government agencies. Uh, we have won multiple national and international awards, including DRDO, Dating 3.0 Contest, National Startup Award, and the industry sector. You won the Electra Spark Startup Award in Electrama, the world's biggest exhibition in electricity and electric equipment, etc. Uh, this is our winning team. Uh, we are a team consists of 15 and 20 people uh, who is working on developing this technology. Uh, we have Professor Yogesh Sharma, who is the professor and one of the India Store Battery Scientists, currently has the R&D team at Indy Energy and developing the battery technology for sodium and batteries. We have been covered by the media uh, uh, for uh, different, different uh, me media agencies for our sodium and batteries. Uh, this is the state of our facility that currently have uh, for making battery materials, uh, battery sodium and battery production facility uh, for using of uh, from agricultural waste. This is a facility of making hard carbon and sodium and cathode up to one kg per day. Uh, this is the electro fabrication facility uh, for making battery cells. It's a dry room facility. So currently we are looking to raise up to. Uh, uh, $3 million. Our next step is to first of all unveil our, sod our sodium and battery product that we're going to do in the next two weeks. And then we will set up a bigger produc production facility to develop an integrated bigger production unit to make sodium and batteries and battery packs uh, for big uh, bigger industrial application like batteries for e-rickshaw, battery for bigger solar and grid storage, bigger solar street lights, etc. Uh, if you have any questions, you may ask. Thank you. This is the website and the email. Thank you so much, Akash. Uh, judges, questions? Uh, I'm, I'm not a big um, expert uh, in, uh, in this field, in the battery field. But uh, apart uh, from lithium and your technology, what are the other alternatives? Meaning, what uh, are competitors basically? Uh, if we'll talk about the alternative lithium and battery, right now, sodium and batteries are the best solution right now. And they can replace lithium and batteries, uh, at least LFP technology for various industrial applications. So, I mean, if you talk about, let's say, ESS systems, energy storage systems, or batteries for small, like two wheeler or three wheeler, uh, sodium and battery could easily repair lithium and batteries. And how many how many projects uh, that are the same as yours are, are are currently running across the planet? So uh, 
I mean, there are a few companies in, in China uh, who has been started working on developing this technology. There's mm -hmm. a huge, huge market available for all the players all over the world, actually. Uh, and they can cater to their needs according to the customers they can find in, in within their country or across the globe. So the competition is not an issue. The, the main question is the availability of the technology and how quickly you can scale it up. And we're work, currently working towards uh, how to demonstrate that this technology can work for these applications. And, and our next stage will be to scale this technology for bigger industrial scale. To, to add up to this, um, uh, we actually have a, a report on the battery ecosystem we can share with you from Atlas Capital, uh, if you want, sure. Frederick. And one of our investment is, um, is a company in the space doing lithium vanadium based in San Diego as well. But yeah, it's super exciting. Um, other questions from judges? Um, I just have one yeah, on the recycling parts of the battery. Uh, do you have any um, concern or uh, maybe uh, in the future, do you project to have like a entity to recycle your own battery? Uh, that's a very good question that you asked. Uh, so sodium and battery do not have, uh, I would say toxic materials uh, that can, I mean, harm the planet or harm the environment. So on a disposable side, it will be safer batteries compared to lithium. But yeah, if you can establish a recycling unit that you may have, but you need to look on the cost and benefit analysis, whether it's cheaper to recycle those materials at scale at that unit price. That's the thing you have to do. But first, uh, I think what there's but one advantage is that even if you dispose these batteries in the environment, they're environmentally safe compared to lithium and batteries. Any other questions? All right, thank you for presenting Akash. Uh, so Akash is, uh, is really uh, one of those CEO doing deep tech stuff. Uh, we've heard a lot about this company from India and, and they are really on the top ones. You can see their credentials. Um, so yeah, uh, anyone interested to invest in the future of climate batteries uh, is kind of a, a big deal and specifically alternative to lithium. So yeah, for everybody, um, I hope Akash, you can share your presentation on fundraising channel and uh, we can uh, we can see if PTT, for example, is interesting to continue the discussion. Thanks, all right. Sir, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. With all that, I think we're going to wrap up. Uh, it's been a great afternoon. We've learned a lot. We've seen a lot of uh, actually deep tech companies today. Um, there is uh, there's a lot more in our deal flow. We've screened through more than 800 companies. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of them are in the US and Europe and they don't want to keep, uh, you know, not sleeping to join. So for next month, uh, we're going to do a hybrid format where we're actually going to have some companies uh, sharing their videos uh, also. Uh, so stay tuned into our YouTube channel to see some of these company pitches. Um, it's not easy for everybody to be attending a, a call like this two hours. We understand that. So we want to we want to make sure that you as investors uh, who are ready to commit capital to climate tech have the easiest way possible to discover as many companies as possible uh, in the space so you can make your own choice on where to invest. Um, we are really thrilled to have the coalition scaling. I just want to give you a little bit of update on this one. We have uh, three chapters right now. We have Singapore chapter with two chapter directors uh, and a dinner happening actually next week, but we run that dinner every quarter. We have a Hong Kong uh, chapter running, Francesco, Francesco uh, and David were some of our guests for the past uh, event uh, two weeks ago. And we have our Bangkok chapter running. We also having uh, three new cities starting in Q1. We have New York, San Francisco, and London. Uh, so then you're going to ask me why, Joan, you're French and you don't have a Paris chapter. Well, I need your help to recruit chapter directors. Uh, so this is how you can help. And if you want to have friends joining the coalition as chapter directors, you can also recommend as people. Uh, again, any um, ecosystem builder who wants to accelerate innovation from North America, Europe to access Southeast Asia market is welcomed and we need a lot of help to do that. 
So thank you so much for joining today. Please share us your feedback and suggestions for this event. Uh, we have a very small team with Atlas Capital, but the coalition is aiming really to have more and more uh, venture capital participating. If you want to take over uh, the next uh, event and organize a, a co-event with your own fund or your own conglomerate, feel free to let us know. We just collaborated with PTT uh, and, and a few other conglomerates for our uh, last Climate Tech Day, for example. Looking forward to have more of this happening. So yeah, thank you so much for joining everyone. Keep interacting on Slack and let's build that ecosystem together of Climate Tech in Southeast Asia. Thank you for today. Bye-bye.